This is the Your Cake Ass Life podcast, episode number 69, with guest Susan Hyatt. All links and resources you hear in this podcast can be found by going to yourkickasslife.com forward slash 69. This is the Your Kick Ass Life podcast with Andrea Owen, a no BS guide to self help and badassery. Because, ladies, let's face it, life's too short for it to not kick ass. And here's your host. The girl who serves it up straight with a side of crazy, Andrea Owen. Hey there, ass kickers. Welcome to another edition of the podcast. As always, I'm so happy that you're here and very excited about today's guest. It's funny, I've known Susan Hyatt for a long time. She was one of the well, if not the first coach, life coach that I found online and started following, and I reached out to her and um, at the time, I was running my business under – well, I should say running my blog. I hadn't even really launched a, an actual business yet, but running my blog under liveyouridealife.com, and that's how I found Susan because she had a very similar URL. Hers was um, Ideal Life Design, I think it was. So I reached out to her and we became friends. This was back in like 07, uh, way back in the dark ages of the coaching world. And I can't believe I haven't had her on my podcast. I've interviewed her different times for different classes as a guest expert. So I'm very excited to bring her expertise for a full episode here. And let me read to you a little bit about Susan if you don't know her. Susan Hyatt is a master certified life coach whose fierce, fun, and fresh approach to personal development has won her thousands of fans on Facebook, glowing praise from icons like Dr. Martha. Martha Beck and Maria Shriver, and a sold-out coaching calendar. As a woman who used life coaching principles to lose 35 pounds, upgrade her career, and revitalize her marriage, she's a coach who truly walks her talk. Her motto, life is precious, go make it delicious. So I'm sh- I'm sure you're going to love Susan as much as I do. This already has been one of my favorite episodes. Um, I'm sure you will love it. So without further ado, here is Susan. And actually, just kidding, I have one more thing I wanted to tell you about. I'm running a free online workshop, a free webinar, and I would love for you to join me. It is coming up at the end of this month. There's two choices to join me in October, the 27th and the 28th, two different times. Hopefully one of them is convenient for you. So if you just hop on over to yourkickasslife.com forward slash free call, it's all one word, yourkickasslife.com forward slash free call, I'm going over my three most effective ways to manage your inner critic. It's the topic we all deal with. It's the topic y'all need help with, ass kickers. So head on over there and I will see you soon. All right. So now, really, without further ado, here is Susan. All right. So we are here and we are on fire. I'm here with Susan Hyatt, everyone. Welcome to the Your Kick-Ass Life podcast. And we are laughing because I just informed Susan that she's episode 69. So how cool is that? Of course. If of you're course a fan. I am. If you're a fan. Uh, <laughs> I can be a fan after a cocktail or two. <laughs> <laughs> the mood strikes you. I was just having this conversation. Thank God my husband doesn't listen to this podcast because I was just having a conversation with him about that. And I was like... <laughs> I'm like, you know, I don't love it. And he was like, how do I not know this about you? We've been married all these years. And he's like, why don't you like it? And I'm like, I just, I feel like there's too many sensory things going on. And I can't, (laughs) I I can't give and receive appropriately at the same time. And he just stared at me like, (laughs) Oh my god! I feel like men aren't as concerned. They're like, just give it to me. Like I I'm gonna care. roll with anything. Come on, baby, I'll roll with it. If I said that, I, in fact, I'm gonna say that to my husband later. I think that is true. I like to focus. I want to do one or the other. Yeah, mm-hmm. I don't. I multitask in a lot of different areas in my life. Oral sex is not one of them. <laughs> <laughs> if that's not the best quote of the whole podcast, <laughs> tweet that, ladies. That, tweet it. <laughs> Tweet that. All right. All right. <laughs> we do have That's other things to talk said. about than just ridiculousness. Um, I'm so glad you're here. And I spent a great deal of time on your blog last week digging up. And I had so many different nuggets that I pulled out and things that I wanted to ask you about. And so <clears throat> this episode's going to be kind of a mishmash of different topics because that's what I love about Susan Hyatt. Nothing is off limits. You t- you help people with their body stuff. You help people with their business. And you help people just in their life in general. Am I right? You're right. Yay. Okay. <laughs> 
All right. So let's start with, let's go, you know, into the deep end. Let's start with the body because I can't remember if this was in a blog post or on some page on your website, but I'm going to quote you. You say, obsessing about your weight and your body is distracting you from doing your real work in the world. And you and I both know, Susan, that the whole loving your body thing can be really challenging for some yeah. people, especially for women. So, and I know you run a whole program on this, a couple of them. So can you tell us about one of the many steps that you take women through? Maybe it's the first one or maybe it's your favorite or the most important. Oh my gosh, there's so many. Yeah, there's a whole program called Bear that is about learning how to love yourself, your body as it is right now. And I kind of came to this work because I also have run and am a partner in a program called the Weight School, which is also weight loss without dieting. But what I noticed was that many of the women who were losing weight and very successful at losing weight were still not satisfied or mm -hmm, still mm -hmm. missing that piece, which is the most difficult piece, like you said, of full acceptance of your body as it is showing up in the world right now. And so one of the first things I have people do in Bear is take a look at their environmental diet. So it's one thing women, and I do believe it, I do believe that women being obsessed with their food and exercise and how they look is keeping us from running the world. I mean, mm -hmm. we would we would be running the show. It would I think the major systems in our world right now, the economy, education, all those things, politics. I think worldwide this shit show would be so much better. Honestly, female energy is what is emerging and what is needed and and us being distracted by bullshit like the thigh gap. Come on, let's talk oh about God. the pay gap. Pay gap, not thigh gap, ladies. Um, and and so the first thing I have people do is take a look at their environmental diet. So what are you reading? What are you watching? Who are you hanging out with? Um, where did these messages come to you in the first place? So it's a little bit of an of a um, excavation of um, did these messages come to you through family of origin? What? And then let's take a look at and document, okay, what are the triggers for you? And so I'm not a fan of like, we're not going to hide in our houses and stay away from the media or magazines and all these things. But it's good to have the awareness that, hey, every time I pick up Shape Magazine, the rest of the day, I'm obsessed with my muffin top or whatever it might be. Or every time I go visit family and there's all kinds of discussion about who's gained weight and who hasn't, that's a trigger for me. It's really good to understand those things so that you can get ahead of that curve yes. and be in control. I love that. And I, uh, I talk about that too. And it's funny. I was just uh, – I had Rachel Rice on here and we were talking about um, the massive amounts of information that we consume daily. And, and a, a lot – there were, there's so many things I think in this world that we can't control. But the things that we can, girl, mm -hmm. let's do it. And so I'm totally with you. So for me, when you said Shape Magazine, mine is Victoria's Secret Catalog. Like, mm -hmm. I, And I love their bathing suits. I do. Mm -hmm. And I actually even like their underwear. Mm -hmm. So – it's, but it's like I had to stop getting the catalog in the mail because I would, you know, just pick it up and just casually flip through it. And it's like, I'm not really looking at the bathing suits suit so much, except like they're very, very flat stomachs. And, you know, and, and I'm like, I don't look like that. And I actually don't even know anyone that looks like that and then feel like shit about myself. And so it's like, why am I doing this? I have mm -hmm. complete control over this. And then mm -hmm. I would feel bad, like, I should have my shit together around this. And it's just like, you know what? <laughs> it's okay. Like, I'm human. And to be inundated with that right. is uh, normal to not feel great. Right. And yeah, I totally agree with that. So anyone listening, what are your triggers? And the people, too. Oh, my gosh, the people. Yeah, and, and the people – and it's like, are you hanging out with people or tolerating conversations that are all about – what we ate, oh my God, we just had this fettuccine, so tomorrow let's go to boot camp. You know, all that kind of stuff, like really pay attention to how you feel around the conversations that are happening mm -hmm. because you don't have to participate in those. I mean, I, I totally, I mean, I think most people around me are <laughs> trained now, but but I do find myself in conversations with women and 
And I try to feel a lot of compassion for where they're coming from because I've certainly been there. But I try to direct the conversation to a more positive thing than let's all talk about how we need to weigh our food. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's just like, you know, so if you're hanging out with someone who's always trying a new diet, um, you could try to help them. But you don't have to buy into what it is they're talking about. Um, And, you know, the thing about that you were talking about, the Victoria's Secret catalog, I got to I don't pick up a lot of magazines anymore. And I was I posted something on Facebook. I took a picture of the wall of women's magazines in an airport bookstore. And I I just kind of was remarking like, wow, like the, the energy radiating off of these covers and headlines were so sick to me and someone went on that thread and said wow it doesn't bother me at all you should really it was kind of like you should have your shit together more what you were saying Mm -hmm. and I was like dude like I am saying that I didn't go into the corner and cry about this I was just remarking that this is not okay with me that every cover is talking to women about how they're not enough Yes, I, I get that. And it's and I I understand what you're saying. It's not for for me in my experience, it's not really a matter of um me being upset for me about all the covers of the magazines. I think about people like my daughter who's six. You know, mm-hmm. a lot of times these magazines are at eye level and she's learning how to read and the messages that we hear and and for all the women out there that maybe ha- haven't done as much work as you or or myself and that are still buying into these and it really is it's so subconscious. It's frightening how mm-hmm. much we do cuz I I grew up, I don't know what your family was like and I remember you telling me a story about I think it was your sister that made a comment about your thighs or something when you were really young and it stuck with yeah. you forever. Yeah. yeah. So for me, it's like I didn't grow up in – like my mom never talked about her body. Like she never even talked badly about other women's bodies. So I kind of grew up in a family where the conversation just didn't exist and I wish mm-hmm. it would have. Mm-hmm. And and I know that there's a lot of women out there that grew up in families where their mothers just bashed on their own bodies and were constantly on diets and talked badly about other women's bodies. However, in my experience, I was a complete victim of the media. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't even as bad back in the 80s when I grew up. And in the 90s -hmm. when I was in my 20s, it just, it was, um, I mean, I grew up Mm -hmm. when Cindy Crawford was, and and now she's considered even curvy. Yeah, she's now considered curvy. What? But that's that's what I get angry and fired up about is just our culture. And I could go on all day about this. And Right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'll move on. But I, I love that. Just basically look at the things that you can control around you. And even if we can't, you know, walk into an airport and I, we don't advise people just going and tearing down all the magazines. But <laughs> just, you know, just don't buy it. And, and don't – or right, get post it and write yeah. notes. <laughs> I've done that before too. Yeah. Um, it just – it, you don't – you have a choice I think in what you choose to put your energy towards is the bottom line of it. Exactly. And to ask the question, what is all this obsession potentially distracting me from? I think that's the biggest – I mean that's what gets me up in the morning to do stuff like this is that there are – talented, amazing women not rocking it in the world because they are so weighed down by this hamster wheel of, uh, you know, to be the fit model Mm -hmm. on Instagram. Anyway. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, that's a great segue for, for what I wanted to talk to you about next. And you have a, uh, it's a Monday podcast, right? You put out a new podcast. Yeah. Yeah. It's new. Okay. And so, and you guys in the show notes at yourkickasslife.com forward slash six, nine, there'll be all of the, the specific links over to Susan's, um, blog posts and and podcast episodes that we're talking about. If you want to go see that, but I, it was in episode 14, you said risk something or get off the stage. And you, um, you quoted a movie and the quote was, you have to risk something for your audience or people will not risk anything for you. And you said, if you want big rewards, you have got to risk something. So back up a little bit and cause it's such a great story. So tell us the story, please, of you being on the airplane and, and speak more into this. Sure. So, so I was, on a long flight and um, was sort of there's no Wi-Fi on this particular international flight so I oh god so I'm like (laughs) perusing perusing the the offerings on their movie selection and 
there was a movie I hadn't heard of on there called Bessie and it starred Queen Latifah and Monique. And so I'm like, okay, that might be good. And, and I didn't know anything about the legendary blues singer, um, Bessie Smith, but she was a real pioneer in music. And it, the movie itself was an eye opener as to how not just African Americans were treated in the twenties and thirties in the music industry, but let alone a female African American. Lord have mercy. So. Anyway, I'm I'm watching this movie and I don't even have my notebook in front of me and um I I start like crying and like where's my notebook to take notes because there's a scene in the movie where um Queen Latifah who plays Bessie is mentored by Monique who played Ma Rainey who was who is like the godmother of blues and jazz. Anyway, um Queen Latifah was was feeling deflated because she's this amazing vocalist and she would sing her heart out for these audiences and they would like boo her. I mean, they were ruthless, throw stuff at the stage. They just weren't having it. And Ma Rainey, who's much older, would take the stage, command that stage and people would be on their feet cheering. And she's like, how in the world? Like, what is she doing? How do I get some of that? Um, and so Ma Rainey, after observing her for a few performances, they were having a rehearsal and she was like, stop, 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 stop. Like you are so busy trying to do jazz and you don't need to know jazz. You need to know the people. And if you're, you're not risking a darn thing on this stage. And if you don't risk anything on the stage, that audience isn't going to risk anything for you. Hmm. And I'm like, yes, this is like business. You were just pumping on the airplane. <laughs> totally. I'm like, oh, my God. So I think um, I'm sure you get questions like this a lot, Andrea, in your business, like, uh, you know, because you've built an amazing tribe following and you have a fantastic business and and um, entrepreneurs, it's it can be hard. It can be tough. And in my opinion. Opinion: The number one way to be successful in business is to risk your ego. Mm -hmm. And without that, you can have all the fancy branding and marketing you want. But if there's no there there, people aren't going to waste their time. True that. And you know what actually made me um, think about when you were telling that story is that this goes beyond entrepreneurship as well, because a lot of my listeners uh, have corporate jobs or <clears throat> or they're staying at home with their kiddos. And I think that that can also be incorporated into relationships as well. Because you know what that is? That's vulnerability at its finest. Oh, yep. And and what, what the question I get asked a lot, um, yes, I get that question from entrepreneurs, but from, I call them, I call them the regulars, like the people that aren't, <laughs> is they want to I, I help a lot of women in their relationships and more specifically their female friendships because you mm. get to be our age, you know, late thirties, early forties, mid forties, and a lot of those friendships that you had in college have gone away or even like your childhood friendships have petered out for whatever reason, divorce happens, we move, things like that. And women, or they've been betrayed and they don't want to trust anyone anymore. Happens mm -hmm. a lot. Mm -hmm. And we just don't know how to be friends. We, I mean, mm -hmm. I didn't. I was at, I look back and I'm like, oh my God, I was a shitty friend <laughs> in my 20s. <laughs> I didn't know how to be. And I had to learn how to do that. But, but what I hear over and over again is I want to, I want to trust women and I want to have that kind of friendship, you know, what Brene Brown calls the move the body friendship, but I want to trust them first before I will, I, I want, I, I want them to get naked before I will is, you know, kind of the metaphor mm -hmm. I'm trying to mm -hmm. use here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it becomes like the chicken or egg thing. And I, what I tell people over and over again is like, if you're going to keep waiting, you might wait forever and you have to, like you just said, like if you want big rewards, you've got to risk something. And you, if yeah. you don't risk anything for them, they're probably not good. They're probably just as scared as you are. Mm -hmm. Somebody's got to make the first move and why not you? And I don't guarantee that it's going to work out. I, I don't. Right. It right. might not. I know there's a, there's a, I am so with you on this in terms of relationships and, and I actually have suffered a big betrayal in the past couple of years from a friendship 
And it was hard. So I totally get my clients say the same thing. Like, you know, I've been burned. I don't feel like I can trust anyone, that sort of thing. And and the thing, there's a quote, God, I, I'm going to have to find it so you can link to it. But it but it's like, you know what? Be the one with your heart wide open, you know, still be the enthusiastic one, still be the one with your heart on your sleeve, because those are the people who have the best relationships. And sure, you might get your heart broken a few times, but the reward of having real authentic other relationships around you or it's just like feel all the feelings. Mm -hmm. Feel the feels. (laughs) It's okay. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. And that's I think that that's kind of. I mean, it could go in that direction too. It's just, I think that's what we do is like we, we get hurt and then we're like, it's not worth it. It's like this pain that I'm feeling right now of being betrayed either in an intimate relationship or a business deal or a friendship. It is not worth it. I'm not going to do it again. And then we don't, I think a lot of people don't fully grieve what mm-hmm. just happened. And it's, mm-hmm. I think, I don't know about the women that come to you, but my women are so fucking smart and they are so they are high achievers and they want to be on to the next thing. Like, ain't gotten, ain't nobody got time to feel the feels. Uh-huh, and uh-huh. I was one of them. Like, I still sometimes have that mentality, you know, and I got, I got sober four years ago as we're taping this. My anniversary was yesterday. And like, that was something I had to learn how to do. And I just, and I would be like, uh, I, can't I just like drink my way out of this? <laughs> For a lot of people, can't I just eat my way out of this? Um, right. No, you can't because it's not going to go away. I thought that if I didn't feel my feelings, like they would just quietly tiptoe out of the room. Damn it, they don't. No, <laughs> they don't. <laughs> I'm with you. It's like, fuck, now I've got to feel something. Yeah, damn it. Yeah, and, and I think that that is such part of the pro- – and that's an assignment I give to sometimes my clients. Like if they have a friendship that has gone away or fallen apart or exploded or whatever – you need to grieve that. And, and a lot, it, it surprises me that so many women don't. I mean, it happened to me too. I had a friendship that fell apart and a, mm-hmm. I was most of the reason that it did. And I had to make amends with that person and I had to grieve it. And sometimes she'll be tagged in a picture on Facebook and she'll pop up in my newsfeed and my, I feel like I'm going to throw my heart up. And it's like, it, it's one of those things where we just, we have to feel the feelings in order to get back up and go mm-hmm. back out there and try to be vulnerable again and risk hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's it's hard. Um, but again, the rewards are tremendous. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. I yeah. mean, we promise you guys, we promise. Pinky swear. For real. <laughs> <laughs> yes. OK. Well, you also say you have so many things that you say on your website. So you say <laughs> passive women do not change the world. It's time to stop being a bystander in your own life. It's time to go after your dreams with the ferocity of a mama bear pre- protecting her cubs. It's time to stir the pot, ruffle a few feathers, and show the world exactly how strong you can be. It's time to make a fucking scene. Yes! <laughs> this pump. <laughs> You're like, who said that? Oh. <laughs> it was me. I know. People quote me sometimes and I'm like, wow, I said that? Really? It's to me too. <laughs> Let's verify that. Let's go to Snopes. <laughs> go to Snopes. So tell tell us about that. Tell us about making a scene. So make a scene is is... God, it, it, sometimes programs just happen. And this is one of those times when, um, I encountered a young woman on the street who was being verbally assaulted. They were about 19 years old, verbally assaulted by a guy. And I intervened just to make a long story really short. I intervened and, you know, I'm five foot three, 125 pounds. This guy's like six, four. Who knows how much he weighed? Big guy. And he's like looking at me like, what in the hell? But he had this flash in his eyes like, this lady's crazy. I better back up. (laughs) And he did. And he left. And when he did, the young woman kind of sunk down to the sidewalk and started crying. And she's like, I'm just so embarrassed that we made a scene. And I said, honey, you're worth making a scene over. And... On, I was on a run when this happened, and when I was running back to my house, I was so full of adrenaline because of what had just gone down. But I would that phrase "make a scene" just stuck with me. And I came home, and it was holiday time, so everybody, my kids were home, and I was telling them what had happened, and and I was like, 
you know, damn it, we're raised to not make a scene. I don't know how many times you heard that growing up, but I heard it constantly. Oh, don't well, make a were scene. Raised, born and raised in the South, so I think it was even worse for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for y'all. It, for y'all. Yeah. I mean, it was like, don't make a scene. It was very much ingrained in my upbringing. And, and I, and, and, it, and, and, Blatant but subtle ways too. Sure. The message was, you know, don't don't be loud, don't speak up, don't draw attention, that sort of thing. And and so that phrase just wouldn't leave me. And I I went to Facebook and talked about it a little bit. And then, uh, you know, the outpouring of messages from people about, you know, the ways in which they want to make a scene in their lives. Uh, so I created a program called Make a Scene, and it, it really is all about figuring out what you want, owning who you are. And I think far too often women are hesitant to make a scene because they don't want to be judged. They don't want people to call them a bitch. They don't want to. And let me be clear. Making a scene isn't about being bitchy. Mm -hmm. It's about owning your power, which sometimes can be perceived that way by people who are threatened by it. But Mm -hmm. nevertheless, it it is really important to stop hiding. Like, right you know, on that stage with Bessie. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And I, I, I love what you said at the end too, because I think that a lot of people and especially women feel like it's either one or the other. It's, it's black or white. The pendulum swings either one direction or the other. Either we be how we were taught, how most of us were taught to hide and be seen and not heard to not rock the boat, to not disagree, to not be too loud, to be a lady, or we are bitchy and loud mouth, foul mouth, um, you know, completely tattooed, smoking cigarettes, (laughs) Mm -hmm. drunk, Mm -hmm. you know, like it's, it's like the dichotomy of it. And it really doesn't have to be that way. I mean, the making a scene is, is to me and I make up that it is just about finding your voice and actually using it and, and being proud of who you are in the meantime, because your scene doesn't need to look like, Susan Hyatt's or mine or Bessie's or whatever it is. Right. Right. It could mean, you know, um, finally volunteering and stepping up at the PTA. It Mm -hmm. could mean asking for the corner booth instead of accepting the table right near the kitchen. Yes. It could, I mean, there are lots of little, little subtle, tiny ways to make a scene and larger ones like getting a new job or going back to school or Or getting tattoos and getting drunk and smoking cigarettes. (laughs) I mean, if that's your thing, (laughs) you could do that. And which I have done. (laughs) I am ink free to date, but that doesn't mean I will remain ink free. (laughs) You decide what to get. (laughs) Well, and I, I think, yeah, I think that for anyone listening, like your scene doesn't need to be, grandiose. I think that that's one of the things that I talk about in um, The Daring Way is the program that I do that's based on the research of of Brene Brown. And one of my favorite exercises that we do, it's, and it it goes really deep and I'll try to, I'll try to make a long story short, but one of the exercises that we do is we figure out what are the things that we do when we are either vulnerable to shame or we're in shame. And Mm -hmm. And they're called shame shields, and there's three of them. And we either people please, we isolate and avoid and hide, or we lash out. Mm -hmm. And I think for – and it can depend. Like we pull out different shields in different situations, like with our husband and at our job and with clients or with our friends or with the PTA moms or whatever. And so I I think that what I I ran a group program, and one of the women – had such an epiphany and she said, I have been pulling out the lashing out shame shield forever thinking that I was standing up for myself and making a scene. And really that doesn't align with who I really am. Like I'm not a bitch. I'm not unkind. I'm not malicious, but it was, I think it's so powerful for people to understand that it's kind of off on a tangent, but it made me think of it because I, my point is, is that like when you're thinking about whatever your scene is, like think about How you want to feel when you walk away from that scene? Like, how do you want to show up and say that you were really proud of yourself? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. The shame shields. Mm -hmm. Love it. Because we all all have them. Because none of us are immune to shame. Like, (laughs) we'll all get in it whether we like it or not. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Can't Mm -hmm. avoid it. And, yeah, we, we pull out one of three. 
And I think it's important for people to know, and it's so powerful for people to know those shields because when you're in it and you you realize, and that's part of what I teach is shame resilience, is instead of, like for instance, I pull out the people-pleasing shame shield when I feel shame with in my marriage. Mm-hmm. And if, if I do something where I, I screw up, like I make a mistake and, and I'm like, oh God, it's that inevitable, like <laughs> the wash of, and it's not like super powerful. It's just, it's a little bit of shame. And I might go overboard to try to people please with my husband. And I'm just like, I'm not a people pleaser. Like I normally would never do that. So instead mm-hmm. of that, what I do is tell him like, I totally screwed up and I feel shame around this. Or if I don't feel comfortable telling him in that moment, I will excuse myself and call one of my girlfriends instead of isolating or instead of people pleasing. And because that's that's the antidote to shame, you know, sprinkle some empathy on that and just be seen. It can't Mm -hmm. exist. So, Mm -hmm. yeah, just a little a little lesson, a little nugget for y'all. Love it. Shame shields for life. (laughs) Go on the road with that. Oh my god. <laughs> yeah, but I, I love that. And and again, you guys, your kickasslife.com forward slash sixty nine for all of the um for all of the links back to Susan's site if you want to read more about her programs. And I just I have one more question before we wrap it up. And mm-hmm. we were talking about this before we started recording, like that that you've been coaching longer than I have, like since way back in like oh six or something and how long ago? Now? It, <laughs> it was, was like 07. 150 yeah. years ago. Yeah. So you, you've just been coaching for about a decade now. And so tell us what the one thing that comes up over and over again. I know there's probably a few, but like the one that comes to mind first over and over again that stops women from making a scene, that stops them from playing big in their life. Uh, the biggest I- excuse I hear from women is that it's already been done. Interesting. Yeah. So it's already been done. You've already done it. Andrew's already done it. Martha Beck's already done it. Brene Brown's doing it better than I could ever say it. So what do I have to offer is really the biggest worry or that, that all of the business building activities are only for extroverts and not for introverts. And people are often surprised to learn that I'm an introvert. So I love when they say that to say, really? (laughs) (laughs) Interesting. Because I'm introverting all over the place Uh around here. (laughs) Interesting. Yeah, I, I hear that too. Like, what do I have to offer I think, like, because I always go, it's so funny, I I always go off on these tangents because I hear something and I must scare people on airplanes because I go, like, seven layers deep. I call it the seven layer dip deep. (laughs) I hear something like that and I'm like, you know what that is, girl, that's worthiness. Let's talk about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) But it is. Exactly. It is. And it's, you know. I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough is the really the root of that faux show. And, you know, there's all kinds of, oh my gosh, entrepreneurs building businesses. Come on. I mean, there's like, there's a ton that, that really swirl around um, that, the worthiness thing, Mm -hmm. but it can show up as everybody's already said it, or I don't have time to figure out these systems or, um, you know, no one's going to want to learn it from me. I mean, it's all all the same mm-hmm. underneath. <clears throat> I've actually heard, like, I've actually had people comment and, like, on my Facebook page and, like, tell me that. <laughs> so it's Tell like, you, it, say what? That it, that's already been said before. And I'm, and I think that, like, I, I've worked on it so much that I'm like, yeah. you're right. <laughs> it has. I, I, anything else you got? <laughs> Right. It's like I actually have something I'm going to put on Instagram today that it's like be be inspired by people all you want, but make sure to put your spin on it. And there are no new. I mean, this is what um, Elizabeth Gilbert's new book. I mean, she so brilliantly talks about it that there are no new ideas. Mm -hmm. There's only your flavor or your spin on ancient concepts people okay (laughs) like right like we didn't make up journaling in this century (laughs) we didn't make up gratitude (laughs) right gratitude (laughs) 
right? And so it's like, well, sure, you may have heard this concept before, but here how here's how I, Andrea, am delivering this to my people. Mm-hmm. Hashtag shut the fuck up. <laughs> STFU. Right. Banning you from my page right now. <laughs> oh, girl. Yes. So. Yes, I, I I totally agree with you a thousand percent on on that. And it's it's funny you mentioned entrepreneurship. I tell people, like if you want the best worthiness workshop, start your own business. Oh, okay. all your skeletons are gonna come out. I'm serious. I say the same thing. I don't say it that way, but I say like you know you want to do some deep personal development, start a business. Start a business. Yeah, I didn't know. Thank goodness I didn't know. <laughs> we were talking about that before we started recording too like we were very ignorant back then and I had no idea it was going to be like that and I actually wrote a blog post back in May about um in defense I called it in defense of the day job because I see a lot of people wanting to be a life coach and for the wrong reasons though it's like they think that like all their dreams are going to come true and I'm like first you need to work on yourself like work on your own issues like fairly extensively and then start to build the business of being a life coach because if you don't and you're in the middle of it and you're, and you're learning all the strategies and like all the head explosion stuff that comes along with it and you're not working on your worthiness, it's going to, I mean, to say it's an uphill battle is an understatement, I feel like. And yeah. I think that's why a lot of people quit. It doesn't, it's not about the strategies. They know the strategies. It is all in your head and it's all a worthiness thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, and I'm telling you, most of the wonderful things in my life, I will say, if I'd known how hard it was going to be, I wouldn't have done it, but it would have been a huge mistake. Mm-hmm. And the mm-hmm. same with building a business. And you just can't know until you're in it. Yeah, you, you, or, you can't. And if anyone, you know, needs help on worthiness, I know a life coach that can help you with that. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It's what I do. I love okay, I love working Andrea. on it. And it's like I just want to say this one last thing about worthiness is that it's not a destination. And, you know, I can't speak from Miss Susan Hyatt, but I my worthiness stuff gets pushed in my face, you know. I heard a quote recently by my good friend Joe Casey. She said, New new level, new devil. And it's so true. I love that. Every time something gets upgraded, either in my life or my business, the the dev, the new devils come out. And, you know, Got to go back to the drawing board. Got to go back to worthiness. And that this actually goes back to what you were talking about in the very beginning about like who you surround yourself with. Because when you, when the new level, new devil comes up and you're surrounded by people that are negative or that are not working on their own stuff or not stepping out into the arena, as we like to call it, it's, it's going to be next to impossible for you to do that. So get the support that you need. Manifest those right people. I have a podcast episode all on that, y'all. So you can go back and listen to that on how to manifest your tribe and and get to it and make a fucking scene, right, Susan Hyatt? Make a scene. The world's waiting. <laughs> well, they have the show notes and how to find all these direct things, but let people know what's the best way you like them to be able to find you. <laughs> Uh, probably my website, shyatt.com. I am on Instagram and Facebook and Periscope. So you can find me at Susan Hyatt on all three of those. Nice. Thank you so much for being here. This has been so fun. So welcome. Thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure. Yay. All right. Episode 70 is coming up next week. And until then, I will see y'all in cyberspace. Bye-bye.